Hi, I'm Tonika Lewis Johnson, and this is how I create. Welcome to This Is How We Create, a show that digs deeper into the creative life of contemporary artists of color. Discover what feeds their creativity and how they've found or are finding their artistic voice. Through these intimate and candid conversations, you'll gain insights into the lives of creative professionals of color that are hard to find anywhere else. Hi there, it's Martine Severn here. Welcome back to the show. We have social justice artist Tanika Johnson on the show to talk about how you can use your art to spark compassion, good citizenship, and to improve the lives of the people in your neighborhood. The first part of our conversation focuses on Tanika's early life, and the second part focuses on how her 20s and her upbringing brought her to create the Folded Map Project as a way to disrupt systemic racism and historic segregation in Chicago. I can't wait for you to dig deep into this episode and get to know the powerhouse that is Tanika. One of her projects is the Folded Map Project, but she has done so much to improve the well-being and to improve her neighborhood, and Chicago as a whole. Please definitely check her out after the end of the show. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to This Is How We Create. I'm so excited to welcome photographer and social justice artist Tanika Lewis-Johnson to the show. Tanika is a lifelong resident of Chicago's Southside neighborhood of Englewood. She is also co-founder of two community-based organizations, Englewood Arts Collective and Resident Association of Greater Englewood that mobilize people and resources for positive change. She is well known for her Folded Map Project, which is a multimedia project that illustrates Chicago's residential segregation while bringing residents together to have a conversation. Tonika turned Folded Map into a nonprofit organization where she serves as executive director. She was named one of the Field Foundation's leaders for New Chicago, and most recently, she was appointed as a member of the Cultural Advisory Council of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events by the Chicago City Council. It's so good to have you on the show, Tonika. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Tanika, I'd love to start by asking you, what were you like as a child? Uh, (laughs) I was a very, as I like to just sum it up and say now, a very weirdo artistic child. I was one of those. It wasn't a lot of those kind of children on the block that I grew up on. So I was the resident weirdo artist kid. (laughs) I took a very early um, liking to reading and poetry um, that evolved into me exploring music and other artistic mediums. So my mom was was always, you know, trying to find some kind of class for me to get into. I loved drawing. I was raised in a house with my grandmother, my mom, and my two uncles who were more like my brothers than uncles because my mom was 13 years older than the oldest one. We were all artists. My grandmother was a a, a painter. She did that as a hobby. My two uncles were amazing illustrators and painters. And my mom was a a writer. So I was just raised in a household that really prioritized um, artistic exploration. My uncles would either be hanging with their friends while they're actually drawing or painting. Music would be in the house. My mom would be, you know, in her room or at the table writing or talking to her friends about screenplay. Like, so that was just, yeah, that was um, my home. And then outside of that, I grew up on a, a block where families knew each other and actually grew up with each other. I never really felt like an outcast because, you know, my mom also grew up on that block. So people who 
lived down the street, knew how my mom was as a teenager. So they really weren't surprised that she raised <laughs> a daughter who was similar, uh, you know, had very interesting likes. I was able to feel normal and comfortable in my unique artistic interests amongst the friends that I grew up with on my block. So, you know, I didn't really, when I did get made fun of, it was just part of typical children friendships playing with each other. I never really felt like an outcast. I just felt very unique as though I viewed my friends. All of us had unique little interests, even though a lot of my friends that I grew up with on that specific block didn't necessarily have artistic interests. A lot of them had other interests that, you know, now that we're adults, I can clearly see the connection. We had a a lot of different kids on our block that had a lot of interesting um, passions. And so, yeah, I just felt like, like I was normal, even though I was a weirdo art kid. It also sounds like you were a very curious art kid or curious kid in general. And I assume that might be because you saw all of the, you saw your family members attempt so many different mediums and different, different ways of engaging with artistry. Definitely very curious. As I got older, I just used to phrase it as being nosy. (laughs) And that also could be, you know, being in a household with, not only my mother, but my grandmother as a matriarch, like just women having a natural, uh, inquisitive, investigative uh, nature. I was definitely raised by women who taught me the, the benefit and beauty of, of curiosity and asking questions. So you are definitely right. Um, that curiosity that was uh, developed and appreciated totally fell in line with taking an interest in in journalism. So yes, I definitely would say curiosity, investigative, nosy nature is is a part of who I am today and was definitely there when I was a child. That's a perfect segue to talking about how you went on to study journalism as well as photojournalism at Columbia College. Can you tell us more about that experience? I am a firm believer in the kind of universal truth that your passion fuels your purpose. And before you realize that it's leading you to your purpose, you're just engulfed in your your passion. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be uh, an individual who discovered many passions at an early age. So by the time I got to high school, I was already very clear that I questioned things that I was learning. So an example, when I went to um, in elementary school um, for four years, I went to a Catholic grammar school and that was my first time like from fourth to eighth grade. And that was, you know, obviously my first time having religion class, like spirituality be part of like my curriculum at school. I didn't have any engagement with Catholicism prior to that. So I discovered a lot about myself and how I received, interpreted and questioned things in religion class because it embodied so much of other subjects to me that I just couldn't mentally separate it. Religion class was focusing on, you know, history. And then, you know, if we were talking about Jesus, it was like, okay, well, he's part of a group of people. Where are these group of people at? You know, and that to me connected to geography. So I just was always questioning like, okay, if I am to believe that this is, or this, this has happened in history, I cannot ignore things that I've learned in geography class, in history class. So I was always 
that kid in the religion class asking, so how did Jesus look? How did he interact with other people that he was around? Like, how was he as a kid? I was just asking all of those questions. And, and one question I can remember asking was, okay, so if Jesus and the group of people that he uh, was raised around, if they weren't practicing Christianity because it didn't exist yet, what were people in the other continents doing? And I remember kind of not getting in trouble for that question, <laughs> but I remember that question putting a pause to, you know, the nun's face that was our teacher. I took that curiosity and, and interest in people and where they're from and how that influences them to high school. My high school was very, very diverse. Um, I went to Lane Tech High School in the 90s. It had an equal percentage of each race, white, black, Latino, Asian. It's a student body of 4,000. So it doesn't matter where you're coming from in Chicago. If you went to that high school in the 90s, you were being culture shock. Like you were just as a 13 year old entering that kind of massive um educational environment, you're just like, oh my gosh, it's so many different people. So through my friendships, I started to discover a real deep interest in photography, poetry, rapping, and a group of friends who had the same inquisitive nature as me. And so after you know exploring all of that for four years, by the time senior year came, I was advised that Everything I'm interested in, writing and questions, uh, perfectly lined up for a uh, major or a profession in journalism. And so I was like, huh, I guess so. I always had an interest in visual arts and, and it really started to focus on photography from my freshman year in high school to senior year. So I wanted to also explore that. And Columbia College was the place where I could I could really dive deep into both of those interests. And so that's what I I decided to do. Um, and prior to my freshman year in college, you know, during the summers, I was, you know, taking extracurricular activities enrolling in journalism programs for teens. So I really got to understand that, oh yeah, I do feel comfortable in this, you know, would be profession for myself. So it was a no brainer for me to go to Columbia College, Chicago for higher education. Um, the only reason I didn't go out of state um, in other schools that had a wonderful reputation for journalism is because I was I was scared. I wanted to stay home. I couldn't wrap my mind around leaving <laughs> leaving home. So so all of those things went into me deciding that I wanted to go to Columbia College for journalism and photography. You sound like you were a precocious and just amazing child and <laughs> young adult. <laughs> <laughs> Very active. Oh my God, bless my mother's heart. Oh my God. <laughs> I was just thinking too. I was like, man, if I had her as a daughter, <laughs> that would be well, fun. Well, it's so it funny, you know, I was um, an only child. So it's, looking back on it and now being a, a parent of two teenagers myself, um, who are very different than I was, have some similar characteristics. You know, once I was engaged in a specific interest, you know, being an only child, you either go one or one of two ways. One, you're the only child that constantly wants um, to be around others and attention because you don't have that at home. Or you're one that is totally comfortable and actually finds refuge in being by yourself, really diving into whatever your interests are. And so I was that kind of only child. I was in a household that had other people. I never felt the need or the crave for 
company because, you know, my my uncles who are like my brothers, their friends were always around. I was on a block with people who I literally grew up with. So I loved being an only child, not having to share my parents, being able to have my own space where I could go into all of my interests. So for my mom, I pretty much <laughs> have figured out that she was like, okay, yeah, once I get her going in an activity, she'll just be off on her own. <laughs> she won't bug me. She won't bother me, <laughs> which was the case. Once I got an interest in piano, uh, she got me enrolled in piano classes. And then I said I wanted to do it at home. So she got me a keyboard first and I would just be in, you know, my own little world making songs on my keyboard. So she really didn't have to constantly engage me. And it also sounds like you were, you were very self-motivated too, that you, as you mentioned, you would just have to start. And then once you started, then you would be good to go. Yes. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting that you say self-motivated because Um, For the longest, you know, I just viewed it from my young mind as as finding answers on my own because I was so curious. So, yes, that does translate into self-motivated. But I just had a very strong hunger for information and answers that I realized I can't wait on nobody to tell me what's what. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what happened post Columbia College. Um, did you go on to practice photojournalism and journalism? So a couple of interesting things happened while at Columbia College. You know, this aspect is very interesting. I primarily operated in spaces until I got to college I operated in spaces that were either predominantly Black or diverse. That was my world. A lot of my educational experience included diversity of people from different nationalities, even if it were majority people of color. I had a very early engagement with with white people. Um, I had a very early introduction of of people who I thought were like Black like me, but were actually uh, have parents from other countries. So I was introduced to that very early on, um, as well as, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in, which is Inglewood, is predominantly Black. So I was just comfortable and familiar with operating in predominantly Black spaces and spaces that were diverse. So when I got to Columbia College, strangely, that was like my first time experiencing being a like minority. Um, it was my first time being the only black person or only black uh, woman, girl. And so that was my introduction into how the world beyond what I had grown up in viewed me or where I came from or my experiences and what I photographed. I learned how people had assumptions and stereotypes of Black people and our experiences and where we live through my photography classes. And so that's when I really got exposed to the misperceptions, the larger public, and ultimately, like, specifically the media had of the neighborhood I grew up in. I was really disturbed by that. And so once I learned what the trajectory was for the professional trajectory for a photojournalist was, it kind of turned me off. A couple of things happened because I took photography classes and had been taking photography classes since my freshman year in high school. By the time I got to college, you know, a lot of these, a a lot of what I was learning wasn't new to me. I was really focusing on sharing my work and developing specific technical skills um, with equipment that I had never been able to have up until college. In any artistic um, class or class that has a focus on a medium, you have critique sessions. (laughs) And since I was the only oftentimes Black person in 
my photography classes at Columbia College, I was the only person sharing photos of black spaces and the responses that I got and questions and critiques that I got just were really off-putting to me. And I learned like, oh my gosh, my photos look very different from my classmates. Their photos focused a lot on landscape, nature, and documenting their spaces. But I also was learning how their spaces look. And I was like, yeah, the mine photos definitely don't look like that. So it was me understanding because I liked street documentation, you know, I was definitely encouraged to to pursue photojournalism. That made me enroll in photojournalism classes. And then once I started learning how photography supports or complements news stories, that's when I started to really understand how neighborhoods like the one I grew up in was being covered, meaning that there was always a very damage-centered perspective, coverage of crime primarily, and me learning that photojournalists, who you should talk to when you're photographing a story about a crime or a shooting or whatever, I quickly assess that if I'm really going to be a uh, photojournalist with the stat with the goal to be a staff photojournalist, I'm going to have to possibly photograph like crime stories in my own neighborhood. <laughs> and, and I just could not wrap my mind around that because that was the direct opposite of what I love photographing. And uh, the direct opposite of your experience as well, right? Yes. I was just like, yeah, I can't can't be a photojournalist if this is how the first part of my career will start out. Like, I know there's other things that I would cover, but that part really turned me off at that age. And so I just accepted the fact that I was probably just going to use my photography to do freelance work um, that would allow me to have more agency over what I covered. During the rest of college, I was just like, I need to explore other professions. And that's what led me to an internship at a social justice publication called The Chicago Reporter. And it's an investigative monthly that covers race, politics, and um, poverty in Chicago. I got that internship when I was in my sophomore year at college. And that internship exposed me to so much. I met so many talented investigative reporters that were on staff doing like amazing, breaking investigative coverage. And I realized, I don't want to do that. That's a lot of work. (laughs) And I was like, oh my gosh, these people are like doctors. Like they're always on call. And since I was an intern, I was helping fact check. And I was like, oh my gosh, people change what they say. I was like, their job is so stressful. But the Chicago Reporter was funded by a nonprofit. It It was a nonprofit publication. They were funded and housed in a larger nonprofit. So because I was an intern that was eventually hired on as an administrative assistant for the Chicago Reporter, I was introduced to the development department because I would have to go talk to the development department of the nonprofit that the Chicago Reporter was kind of housed under and like give them information about the awards Chicago Reporter won so that they can include in their grant proposals. And I was really intrigued by the development department. I was like, so what is this you all do? What is a grant? Why? What is this? I got curious about that. That would eventually become the profession I would go into after um, college. I started to work in the development office of different nonprofits, starting off as like a development coordinator, then a development assistant, and then a grant writer, and then a grants manager. So that was the majority of my 20s alongside of me becoming a 
a mother and a new and a and a young wife and a new homeowner in the neighborhood I grew up in, Inglewood. So all of those things are happening in my twenties. So photography actually as a result of all of juggling all of those things and exploring a new profession, photography took a back seat because another interesting aspect of what happened in the realm of photography is um, digital photography was starting to become more accessible and affordable to the larger public in the early 2000s. Because of my age, I was one of the last generations to grow up on film, like learning photography on film only. And so by the time I was in my early 20s, you know, my age group, digital photography was becoming a little bit more accessible because prior to that, Digital photography was so expensive that it was really for like fashion advertising photography. And you would have to be able to afford and purchase a digital back to put on to a very specific expensive camera. But in the 2000s, digital photography was becoming more accessible. And since I had a few cameras that were just film only, I was like do I want to switch over and get a digital camera? And I'm not even really taking photos as much as I used to. So I went on like a seven year hiatus from photography in my twenties. And I was just focusing on this new profession and being a new mother, um, a new wife and a new homeowner. I was also getting to know the neighborhood I grew up in in a different way as a, as an adult, as a homeowner. So that's what my 20s was like after after college. Oh, to think that your superpower is that you you learned all about grants and all about all about just raising money, which is something I think most freelancers and most uh, creatives really struggle with. And I think in doing the research for this for this interview, did you pick up an MBA along the way? Yes, I did. And so I graduated from Columbia College in 2003. I was on that traditional five-year plan at Columbia College. But I also got married, had my my first child in my last year of completing college. So literally during that last year of college, dealing with the aftermath, if you will, of 9-11. And so the market (laughs) took a turn. Like people weren't able to find jobs. I mean, it was just, okay, I'm graduating in of time in our country. We're still dealing with the devastation of 9-11. And so the job market just wasn't, what it was. I was like, oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? It's really a competitive market right now. And, and so I was like, let me just go back to school. (laughs) And so I thought about what is it that I don't know a lot of that I'm so curious about? And it was business. I went back to school and went to National Lewis University because they had a flexible MBA program. um, Since I was, you know, juggling like being a new mom and new wife at that time. I can't believe you you talk about all of this like, oh, I just did this. <laughs> I can I can't. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine being a new mom and also going to school and getting an MBA at that. You're a superwoman. <laughs> oh, um, oh, thank you, thank you. It didn't feel like it at the time. It felt like I was an unemployed mom who <laughs> who was trying to figure out how to how to make the most out of the fact that I was unemployed but the beauty of being able to be home with my kid I mean my daughter at the time while my husband was the person who was primarily working so it just it just felt like I was making decisions that could potentially help us in the future. But, and that's how I viewed it. I I, I definitely didn't feel like it was superwoman at all. (laughs) 
I guess it never feels that way. <laughs> so at this point, I'd love to turn um, our attention to the Folded Map Project. This project has changed the lives of many, and it's changed the way that Chicagoans view their city. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you came up with the idea? Yes, I often joke with people and say, um, Folded Map is really my life in a multimedia project. (laughs) It was born out of my early exposure to other neighborhoods, starting primarily with high school. Um, I had never been to the neighborhood that my high school was in, and I had to make that daily commute from Inglewood to my high school, 15 miles north to my high school, which was in a predominantly white neighborhood. And so experiencing what that commute was like on public transportation every day as a 13, 14, 15 year old, it just, it really impacts you because especially in the early nineties and I, and I say this to younger people when I I'm talking to them so that they can understand there was no cell phones. Like I didn't have anything other than a Walkman. And if I wanted to read a book, to occupy my time on my public transportation. So it was either look out the window while listening to your music or read a book. And since I knew I was going to school and I was going to have to focus on reading at school, oftentimes I would just choose to look out the window and listen to my music and or go to sleep. On that daily commute, I started to really see the gradient of change from my neighborhood to the neighborhood that my high school was in. And, you know, being that curious youth, I just always wondered, like, why is that? Why does my neighborhood look so much like look worse than other neighborhoods? And it wasn't reflective of the amazing community that existed in the neighborhood. I was like, this don't make no sense to me. And then I also noticed the streets were the same that existed in my neighborhood and the neighborhood that my high school was in. And that was something that I'd never thought about before until I started making that everyday commute to high school. I was like, you know, oh my gosh, Polina definitely doesn't look like this in Inglewood because the, literally the same exact streets that are in Inglewood, I was seeing every day in the neighborhood that my high school was in, which is 15 miles north. So it just got me to understand Chicago's map in a very... Um, specific way that a lot of teenagers who were on public transportation going to school in the early 90s, we had to know. Like there was no no other way for you to figure out how to get to school in the early 90s. There was, there was no MapQuest. There was no Google Maps. There was no app for directions. Like, I mean, there was, but you had to print it out on paper. It was just, you know, so it was literally like, you have to kind of know what Chicago's map means. And you have to memorize the numeric value of certain streets if you want to hang out anywhere. So all of those things was playing out during high school for me. And then, you know, the beauty of once I got to high school, I was exposed to so many other neighborhoods in Chicago that I wouldn't have otherwise, because these amazing people who became my friends in high school, this is where they were from. Seeing that that kind of yin and yang allowed me to be very sensitive to observing what segregation does to people, especially as I got older. Um, and so Folded Map enca- encapsulate my observations as a, as a teenager on public transportation, you know, how I got to understand that Chicago's grid map has mirroring points <laughs> on that map. It encapsulates the opportunity of of what being exposed to diversity can allow you to understand about historic issues and how you can actually disrupt systemic issues by having relationships and friendships with people who have a different lived experience than you, because that was really my high school experience. And so I was able to 
put all of that alongside my passion for photography into a project that exposed beyond a shadow of a doubt the present day impact of historic segregation. And I created that project because I was frustrated with how people talked about my neighborhood in the 2016 presidential election, how people talked about Chicago, specifically our former president, how he talked about Chicago as as a platform to show the the challenges and issues and faults within President Obama when they were running. And I was just like, oh my gosh, people really do think Chicago is just like a, like a Western movie, just shoot them up. And I was like, what? How can they talk about Chicago like this without including the very real and historic discriminatory housing policies, segregation, disinvestment in black communities, and just only talk about crime? So I just got really frustrated and fed up that presidential election year of 2016. And that's what prompted me to kind of put all of my lived experience into the project Folded Maps. I wanted to be able to use segregation as the tool to bring people together while also showing people the present day impact of historic racism and segregation in Chicago. That is what allowed me to to create this project. And I definitely didn't anticipate the positive reception to it. Um, When I started to solicit participants for the project, because I identify certain blocks on the south and north side that represent If you were to fold Chicago's map at a zero point, which is downtown Madison, and you were to fold the map, the neighborhoods that would touch my home neighborhood are the north side neighborhoods of Rogers Park, Andersonville, and Edgewater. And so I really wanted to demonstrate to people how you can get to know someone with a different lived experience and use it as an opportunity to understand inequity. So that is what Folded Map is, and that is how I come to create it and, and, and why. And how do you get people to interact with each other? Um, I solicited people um, on the specific blocks that I wanted to highlight for the larger public to understand that you have mirroring addresses in this city. <laughs> um, and so I... I identified people or certain blocks that I wanted to find participants for the project for. And so I sent out like a mass request on paper in a package envelope and put it in the mailboxes of several people. I had help doing that well, on several blocks and I had help doing that. And so the participants of Folded Map are literally people that self-selected themselves. So everyone who's in Folded Map wanted to be a part of this weird project that that makes sense now to the public. But imagine trying to explain something that <laughs> like like this project that doesn't exist. <laughs> everyone who participated in Folded Map are individuals that saw my vision before it was, you know, actually completed they knew or they felt that this issue was important and they wanted to participate. So I, a part of the project is introducing MAP twins to each other. I went about introducing the participants to their MAP twin because they were interested in participating and they knew that that was a part of the project and they were open to this kind of exploratory experiment. It was for me, the most beautiful part of the project. Living in Chicago, now you make me think about who my map twin is. Um, (laughs) I'll have to look it up for our address. Did you come to see many common themes with people's responses to the project, specifically the people who found their map twins and were able to have conversations with each other? Yes. So what I did... um, I asked all of the MAP twins the same five, six questions individually and again when they were together. 
what was interesting is noticing that all of them ultimately wanted the same thing. And they, and they all recognize that regardless of how differently they experience Chicago or feels like Chicago makes them experience life differently, they all recognize that they want the same thing, which is a good quality of life and community. And it was really that simple. Them recognizing that they want the same thing while also recognizing oftentimes very uncomfortably, oh, it's very clear it's a map twin out of out of us that is experiencing the benefit of Chicago and and another is not. And so that was kind of eye opening for all because there were some map twins who were from Inglewood that was not aware of how over-resourced certain neighborhoods on the north side was until they heard their map twin explain. And they were like, I knew that it was invested in, but oh my God, you mean that you have so many options of restaurants in walking distance? That's something no one could ever imagine having in, in Inglewood because it just, it hasn't existed for decades. So it was really an uncomfortable learning experience that ultimately connected these individuals because they were going through this, this, this realization together and, and coming to the terms that neither one of them had a role in creating this segregation. And so that was the commonality and ultimately the solidarity, like, even though one map twin is is receiving the benefits of segregation, that person still didn't create this system. For the person who was on the on the unprivileged end of Chicago segregation, um, felt validated in, in in sharing and having someone else say, "Yes, that is not fair. I didn't know. I didn't know." And so it just provided a space for um, a different kind of trust and understanding to to be shared with the larger public and and hopefully you know would lead to people using it as a model to understand that these are the kind of conversations we have to have and that we can have on a personal um, level that could influence systemic change and ultimately a, a fair more equitable integrated chicago that um, that is so true. It also, as you were saying those words in terms of the map twins meeting, and then realizing that those in Englewood have a lot fewer benefits, if you will, um, whereas the people in who are the map twin in Rogers Park, they just have a lot more resources, such as restaurants within walking distance. You know, at times people incorrectly assume that the neighborhoods that aren't very well and that don't have as many resources it's because they're they're just not being they don't have investments you know there aren't the the city itself isn't investing in those neighborhoods and it makes me think of martin luther king's quote where he talks about how it's not right to tell the a person to pull up their their selves by their bootstraps when that person actually has no boots the change will start when we see more and more investment in the neighborhoods that have been neglected for i don't even want to say years right centuries decades decades so, yeah. yeah decades mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well i'd like to chat just a little bit about funding because to do this project you must have had to put on your that hat that funding hat to think about where you would get resources to make it happen well actually quite the opposite um (laughs) i was working a full-time job at um growing home which is um an amazing nonprofit based in Inglewood that is an employment training program for people who have barriers to employment 
that allow them an opportunity to do a three month job training on an urban farm <laughs> in in Inglewood. So I was actually employed at Growing Home as in the employment training department. I was working this full time job when I decided I was tired of just only thinking about this project and I wanted to actually work on it. And so after the presidential election year, I was like, you know what, I'm going to have to figure out a way to really dedicate time to work on this project just to get it out of my head. I was already working on it, you know, in my mind, I already knew the neighborhoods I wanted to compare. I already knew the certain streets that I wanted to compare. I had started, you know, just taking some like cursory photos of, of, of houses, but I was like, man, I need like more time than after work and on weekends because, you know, I have, I had children at that point I was divorced. So I was like, I need more time during the actual work day. And so while I was struggling with how I was going to work on this project, an opportunity to apply to this part-time fellowship by City Bureau appeared. I had found out about this amazing civic journalism lab because they had reached out to me for another project that I had started to get some recognition for called um, Everyday Inglewood, which was just a collection of my Inglewood photo archive. And so they had invited me to speak at their at their event, at the workshops that they would host regularly. And then they had this fellowship opportunity that they sent to me. It was like, oh, you know, we're starting a fellowship opportunity for people who want to get a little money to work on a project that they would like to do that, you know, focuses on a variety of things. And I was like, I'm going to apply. If I get this fellowship, I'm either going to have to quit my job or ask to go part time at my job. <laughs> so I was like, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Let me just apply. And so I applied to the fellowship and I got it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, let me ask to go part time. This probably won't work. So I probably need to get ready to look for another part-time job, which wasn't so scary for me because prior to working at Growing Home, I had, I was a teaching artist teaching photography for an organization called Changing Worlds. I had done that for five years part-time. So I just considered the fact that, okay, I'll probably have to just do part-time teaching artist work again. So I went to my supervisor you know, all of them knew of my work in the community. They knew I was a photographer. So the request of wanting to do something outside of work that could impact work related to photography, I knew wasn't going to be a huge surprise. But to literally ask, can we cut my full time job down to part time? <laughs> That's quite ridiculous. Um, but I did. I asked my supervisor and she was like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, say what? <laughs> so I was working part time and going to the fellowship and the fellowship really allowed me to get some income for working on this project, like doing the legwork to really put it together. And although I didn't finish Folded Map during that fellowship, it gave me such a great head start that by the time the fellowship was over, I just stayed part time at my job and just continued to work on Folded Map. So funding was not anything I had in the creation of Folded Map at all. It was totally just passion and and like um, me using my own resources, whether it's friends who did video videography for Folded Map. Um, off the strength of really being passionate about the project, um, me being able to get um, opinions, expert opinions about the project from people at City Bureau. Like I was really tapping into my own resources to to make this project um, happen and to complete it. Uh, funding for Folded Map was not even a consideration until 
after the project was exhibited at Loyola University Museum of Art of art and really honestly after it closed because it was during the exhibition period that the public reception for the project really took off and I was like oh my gosh this is turning into something I didn't anticipate so that's when the conversation I had with myself about funding came up and I was like one I need to create a website for this project because once the exhibition ends it won't exist anywhere so that's when I, I did a fundraising um, Kickstarter campaign um, to create the website for Folded Map, as well as to get equipment that I knew I needed if I wanted to do more Map Twins. And so that was the first time that I had done any fundraising for Folded Map. Um, and quite honestly, one of only a few times. Um, so, yeah, it was not a consideration in the beginning at all. But now that Folded Map is formalized into a nonprofit, that's I have to put that hat back on. Hmm. Well, can you tell me a little bit about what opportunities have come your way through Folded Map, um, particularly opportunities that you might not have expected? Um, the opportunity to be a self-employed artists um once i created the website after having a successful fundraising campaign um you know i was able to raise like twenty thousand dollars when i requested just 13 so i was able to pay for my amazing friend to to design the website I was able to get equipment that I needed um, instead of borrowing equipment from City Bureau. And and then I was able to um, pay for a lawyer to help begin trademarking Folded Map. Um, I was able to really use that money to set myself up to be a self-employed artist. So that's definitely one thing the project allowed me to be able to do. It allowed me to um, eventually focus on working on engagement of the project full time. Um, and so as I started to get invites for presentations and, and, and paid workshops, it, it opened me up to knowing that I could actually be a self-employed artist that can focus on issues that are important to me and share that with people who are now my audience. So that above all else was life changing. And, and I've, I've been operating that way for two years now. Actually, wait, 2018, 2019. 20. Oh my gosh. I said two years. It's three going on four. Oh my gosh. So yes, you know, now I'm able to employ myself through this project, which opens up my mind and my creativity of ways to continue this engagement that I wouldn't have thought of otherwise if I was thinking within the limits of time that I had after working a nine to five job. Like I wouldn't have been able to envision the kinds of engagement I've been doing with the larger public around not only the issue of systemic racism and segregation, but specifically Folded Map. Um, and then I have other projects that were created as a result of the enga engagement through Folded Map that I had time to work on my project um, called Belonging that focuses on black and brown teenagers in the spaces and where they've been made to feel like they don't belong through, throughout Chicago. I would have never been able to work on that project if I at the, at the magnitude in which I did if I was still employed by someone else and doing my art on the side so that's the primary change and difference you know being able to focus full time on these issues and my projects has really transformed my life well thank you for doing this project thank you, you know, for it's about amazing it. it's just it's really amazing when I heard about it and read more it and talking with you now it just makes so much more sense it's 
it's a duh moment, right? It seems like your whole childhood and your whole experiences in that university and high school was bringing you to this point. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Which is, you know, why I tell people when they say, how did you come up with this project? <laughs> I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that this project couldn't have been created by someone from academia only. It could not have been created by somebody who was focusing on urban planning only. It could not have been created by someone who focused on sociology only. It could only be created by someone who has a lived experience that has been impacted by how segregation and historic racism has influenced their lives across all of these areas. For me, that amplifies the purpose, beauty, and reason for people to listen to those who are most impacted by all of these systemic issues. Um, because that's what Folded Map is. I didn't go to school for urban planning, even though, funny enough, I went to technical high school, but I didn't even learn about urban planning then. And also artists. Yeah, that's what I'm most proud of, is the fact that I can say that a little Black girl from Inglewood who grew up to create this project <laughs> has helped people see how historic racism and segregation still impacts our lives and social networks today. And so I just hope that it will inspire other little Black geniuses in neighborhoods that <laughs> have experienced disinvestment to be confident in their genius and also for others to recognize that we just because people are from neighborhoods or places that are most impacted in the worst way by racism, capitalism and colonialism doesn't mean they are not brilliant. Like it actually means the opposite that <laughs> because of that, <laughs> They are the most <laughs> brilliant. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's 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 why I love being able to say that Folded Map is the embodiment of of my life. And it doesn't sound. It sounds like your younger self would not have be surprised at all <laughs> that you were doing <laughs> this. <laughs> She would be like, "Of course." <laughs> yeah, looking uh, back, it totally makes sense. But mm -hmm. you know, you never know at the time. You just know that you're in pursuit of some like hunger to do something, whether it's focus on your artistic passion or interest or whatever, you just know that something is driving you, whether it's a curiosity or whatever. And you have to, there's several points in your life where you have to make a difficult decision to commit yourself to it. And for some, it's not difficult for others. You know, it is, you know, I definitely had points in my life where I had to advocate for my my interest and my passion. And it, it caused me to have to make difficult decisions or, or align my life in a way that was going to serve my purpose. That can take a long time for individuals and people. And it's okay because we, you know, in, in this country specifically, we feel like we have to achieve a certain level of like this insane amount of idea of what success is in our twenties or thirties, like, you know, we just, it's a crazy culture in the United States of, of when you're supposed to a acquire a certain amount of wealth or purpose or whatever, it doesn't work that way. And I just hope that, you know, me even talking about the road to me creating Fold and Map helps people understand that it's fine to be 38 and 39 and finally being able to culminate the purpose of your life into something that you're passionate about like because that's what I was you know none of this the the creation of Folded Map didn't happen until my late 30s it's technically only the beginning you know I just hope that creatives individuals and just people overall remove that pressure that societal pressure to have everything figured out by the time they're like 30 like what insane <laughs> I agree so I wanted to turn our attention to 
uh, something a little bit lighter before we leave. It's just a little bit of fun that we have before as we wrap up the episode. The, so the question I have for you, it's one of our quick fire questions. We've been listening to your beautiful voice for a bit now, and I would love for you to tell me what's one thing about you that we would not know from just hearing your voice. <laughs> um, I would say not only from hearing my voice, but considering, you know, my medium of art, people do not know that I am practically visually impaired. I wear contacts because my vision is so bad. <laughs> like without contacts, I can barely see anything with sharpness and clarity. Like my farsightedness is so bad that it's teetering on being both. <laughs> so <laughs> people always like I'm I'm sure my my vision is just as bad as it. No, 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 no. My glasses are so thick that I could never. They're like Coke bottles. <laughs> I could never consider wearing my glasses without getting them thinned first. And I don't ever wear my glasses outside. They're only for inside the house. <laughs> I have tried to wear my glasses while taking photos. It's too problematic. It bumps up against the the camera. I, the the fog from my breath goes there. It's just no one would ever know that I wear glasses. And no one even really knows that I wear contacts to see. And so really, you know, I am I am very close to just being classified as visually impaired, like honestly. <laughs> so no one would ever know that, but now they do. Now well, they do. I wouldn't have seen, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed that because, you know, when we were doing, um, when we both had our videos on, you were not wearing glasses then. <laughs> because I you knew I was going to see our video with you. <laughs> no one, the public does not see. My friends barely see my glasses. Well, Tanika, I command you for following your intuition and for making Chicagoans more compassionate. Thank you so much for putting Englewood on the map so that more resources can be poured into that community for a more equitable tomorrow and so that all the neighborhoods that that surround Englewood will also benefit. You're such an inspiration. Thank, well, you, thank you, you for so much, for chatting with me. I'm I really appreciate talking with you. Thank you. Thank you.